Good afternoon again, everyone. And again, welcome to the STI clinical update called Back to Basics, Fundamentals of STI and HIV Prevention. And we have Drs. Katerina Liu and Dr. Curtis Moore presenting for us today. My name is Dr. Kelly Johnson. I'm the medical director of the California Prevention Training Center. And I'm also a public health medical officer in the STD control branch for the California Department of Public Health. I'll be emceeing today's webinar and just going over some quick introductory slides. I'm gonna go off video while I do this to save us a little bit of bandwidth. So first, a little bit about the California Prevention Training Center or CAPTC. The CAPTC is a multidisciplinary training and capacity building assistance center. Our STI clinical training is sponsored by the CDC and we are a member of the National Network of STD Clinical Prevention Training Centers, or NNPTC. Through our STI clinical training, we provide virtual and in-person training events, technical assistance, clinical tools, and STI clinical consultation services, focusing on complex STI issues in patient care. You can learn more about our STI clinical training at CAPTC, and also about the NNPTC by visiting the web pages listed on this slide. The CAPTC also runs the STD Clinical Consultation Network for our region. This is an online clinical consultation network where providers can submit complex STI questions and a subject matter expert will reply either by phone or email per your request within one to five business days. Here's our financial disclosure. We have nothing to disclose. And here's our CME disclosure stating that today's webinar is offered at 1.25 units. Here are the CME requirements to earn those 1.25 units. So you must have registered for today's webinar on the NNPTC site by the deadline. Please note that registration is now closed. You need to stick with us for the full webinar today by watching it live and in full. Unfortunately, we can't give CME credit to those viewing the recording of this webinar. Attendance will be noted as attendees sign on to the webinar. You will also need to complete the post-course survey evaluation by April 5th, 2023. Those registered on the NNPTC site for this webinar will receive an email notification from training at nnptc.org with the link to the post-course survey evaluation within 24 hours following the end of today's webinar. The notification is sent to the same email address that you use to register for the webinar on the NNPTC site. To ensure you receive the notification, please add training at nnptc.org to your safe and trusted senders list, and also check your spam and junk folders if you don't see this email in your inbox. CAPTC's CME provider is the University of Nevada, Reno School of Medicine, or UNR. If you meet CME requirements, you'll receive notification from CAPTC at ucsf.edu within approximately four to six weeks from the post-course survey evaluation deadline. And this will have the link to claim your CME certificate from UNR. The notification again is sent to the email address that you use to register for today's webinar. To ensure you receive the notification, please add captc at ucsf.edu to your safe and trusted senders list. And again, please also check your spam and junk folders if you don't see the notification in your inbox. Next, just a couple of quick housekeeping notes about Zoom. Microphone, video, and chat will be turned off during the webinar for attendees. Presenters will have access to the microphone and video only. The Q&A will be turned on for attendees to access during the webinar to submit your questions. To use the Q&A, click on the Q&A icon as seen here in the middle of this slide, which will be on the bottom of your Zoom screen. Once you click on the Q&A icon, you can type in your question and click send to submit. If you want to send your question anonymously, you can select anonymous. You can submit questions up until the last two minutes of the Q&A section. Also during the webinar, I'll be reviewing the Q&A and may answer your questions directly, or they may be answered live during the Q&A session. You can also submit any administrative questions into the Q&A and they will be answered by our clinical administrative team, Elizabeth Olson and Lauren Blakely. If you have any questions, you can reach out to Elizabeth Olson, who is the CAPTC Clinical Program Manager. 
Her email address is shown here on this slide. And now I have the pleasure of introducing our speakers. First, I'd like to introduce Katerina Liu. Dr. Liu is a public health medical officer with the immunization branch at the California Department of Public Health. Her work focuses on the promotion of vaccination in adults. We're also fortunate to have Dr. Curtis Moore. Dr. Moore is a family medicine trained physician and recent 2022 graduate from Kaiser Permanente's HIV fellowship program. He joined the California Department of Public Health in November of 2022 as a public health medical officer in the STD control branch. His work focuses on preventative measures such as doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis and hepatitis B and C screening outreach, along with disseminated gonococcal infection investigations. And without further ado, I will turn it over to our speakers. Thank you again for being with us today. We're looking forward to your talk. All right, thank you, Dr. Johnson. I'm gonna go ahead and get my screen set up here. And then I trust people can see the screen at the moment here and get a verbal confirmation. Yes, looks good, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, again, uh, Curtis Moore here, nice to meet everybody. Good afternoon. Without further ado, we're gonna jump right in. We'll start with our learning objectives. And number one, kind of review screening and treatment resources for STIs, sexually transmitted infections, and HIV. Number two, we're going to integrate biochemical preventative tools for STIs and HIV into clinical practice. And then my associate, Katerina, will summarize some vaccinations towards the end of this, this uh, lecture. Here's an outline of what I'll be discussing at the top, some bacterial STIs going through statistics, a case scenario, and some antibiotic prescribing practices. And then at the bottom, I'll be reviewing various HIV preventative strategies. Here in California, you'll notice a steady climb of bacterial STIs, the red orange line on the top for chlamydia, blue green for gonorrhea in the middle, and purple for primary and secondary syphilis at the bottom. You'll notice a sharp drop in chlamydia and slightly smaller drops for gonorrhea and syphilis in, around 2020, but bear in mind, this is likely related to a lack of testing during the COVID-19 pandemic rather than a true decrease in STI burden. What is not shown here are populations disproportionately impacted with the burden of STIs, which I'll highlight a little bit later. In reference to congenital syphilis, you'll see on the right, outlined in red, how California starting around 2012 is outpacing the US average of cases per 100,000 live births. We'll touch base on a slide a little bit later about CDPH specific screening recommendations for congenital syphilis. Returning now about to our affected groups and the many disparities that contribute to STIs, these are what we call social determinants of health, which involve a complex interplay of factors such as poverty, stigma, housing and food insecurity, discrimination, racism, medical mistrust, violence and trauma, access to care, and education, and all of these play a role. The priority populations, as you can see, are adolescents and young adults, MSM, men who have sex with men and transgendered persons, racial ethnic minorities, and these all require some more focus and attention and care. An example, when compared to the California's average, the rates of reportable STIs among African Americans in California is 40% higher for chlamydia, 180% higher for gonorrhea, and 120% higher for early syphilis. That's why it's important for us as providers and clinicians and educators to make good efforts to recognize these disparities and provide equitable access. All right, let's start with a case and a poll question. So me, Taylor, this is a 27-year-old male who comes in for a wellness visit. What STI sexually transmitted infection screenings would you offer or think about for Taylor? And at this moment, you should see the pop up that you want to click all that apply. And as you answer, um, it's okay if you can't remember what you're supposed to order or think about for this patient. That's why you're here to learn and improve your knowledge. Um, and it might be better not memorizing everything because guidelines and recommendations do change. And we want to make sure we have the most up to date information. So today we're going to share a lot of uh, resources for you and kind of think of it as your second opinion. Give it a couple more seconds for people to answer. Okay. 
and five more seconds. All right, let's see what answers have come up. We got a nice variety there. Essentially almost everything was selected. Excellent. Okay, but before we get to those answers, the first step we have to do is take a very good sexual history for our patients. And as you can read, if we don't ask, we, know, we won't know what to do for our patients. Now the CDC does offer their five P's model. So partners, who is the person having sex with, practice what kind of sex are they having, anal sex, oral sex, vaginal sex, or use common terminology, are they top, bottom, side, verse? These are things that patients might re reference to. Protection from STIs. Do they or their partner use condoms? Are partners getting tested? Are they using any prophylactic medications? Past history, have they had an STI before? Do they know what STIs are out there? And then pregnancy plans, birth control, wanting a child, et cetera. All of these are important to ask and guide uh, for the best care for our patients. I've put some links to the California PTC webinar and an American Academy of Family Physicians article reviewing sexual history taking for your reference. All right, back to our case. Now let's say you've taken a good history. Our patient Taylor tells you that he identifies as a same gender loving male, a man who has sex with men. And I wanna ask yourself, does that change your answers to those, those questions of SCI screening? Because it might. Uh, it turns out that screening for STIs can be different for specific populations. And so you need to take that good sexual history to know how we can address particularly this patient's needs. Here is the answer for Taylor. Starting at the top, uh, because Taylor identifies as a man who has sex with men, he should be offered screening for gonorrhea and chlamydia at all sites of exposure. So urethral urine, throat or pharynx, and rectal. In addition, Taylor should be tested for syphilis, HIV, hepatitis B, and C serologies. On the right in red, these are not recommended for routine screening. Now, there are various guidelines to use when it comes to screening for patient populations, and I've provided the hyperlink to California specific STI screening recommendations. And just below that is a quick PDF guide hyperlink as well. This guide I've clipped out on the bottom for the population-based section on men who have sex with men is kind of basically telling you on the left who to screen, what to screen in the second column, and how often to screen in the third and fourth columns. And when you access these hyperlinks, the recommendations will guide you to which focus population you're treating. Now, if you're using the CDC webpage as a resource, you are able to search by disease or by, by population. I circled the population tab here and then selected for MSM population. CDC also provides additional STI information. Examples in purple are the herpes and HPV. Uh, for herpes, it is complicated, and there's an entire webinar produced by the California PTC that I encourage you to watch, and the hyperlink is in the uh, box at the bottom left in purple. HPV, similarly, is equally controversial in the men who have sex with men, and I encourage you to research that as well. Now you're probably thinking, Dr. Moore, this is too much. You're telling me to click this and that, go to this link, click a tab, scroll, play search and rescue on some sort of web page or info. There has to be an easier way. And for that, I'm including these two applications. So for the busy working clinician, these things can be very helpful. So on the left is the United States Preventive Service Task Force app where you put in patient details and are given recommendations. Now it's not exclusively about STIs, but it does give you great information. So you click sexually active, you click yes under that tab, and then it offers the recommendations. And in these arrows here, this points to a screenshot showing HIV screening, offering HIV prep, syphilis screening, and then you would scroll through to see what the USPSTF rec recommends. Now, my preference personally on the right is the CDC STI treatment guideline app, and it works much like the CDC webpage I showed you earlier. But on this application, you'd click on the screening button, you'd select your patient's specific population for screening recommendations, and for here we have women, pregnant persons, men who have sex with men, and persons living with HIV. 
And then it gives you what are the recommendations for screening in these patient populations. And so I do highly recommend both of these apps when seeing patients. All right, although it's unrelated to our patient, Taylor, epidemiological data in California shows increased uh, cases of congenital syphilis. Now the type right, you see that snippet of the graph I showed you earlier, kind of showing the rise, uh, rising epidemic in California. And so I've added this slide here as a reference for those folks who take care of or see persons who can become pregnant, recommending specific California um, recommendations and guidelines that are not uh, especially expressed in the USPSTF and CDC apps that I was recently showing you. CDPH has released a health alert and a dear colleague letter to help notify providers about these increases in congenital syphilis cases and what to do about them, particularly focusing on screening pregnant patients who have interrupted or disrupted prenatal care at various locations. Now, providers should be aware that we screen all pregnant patients now three times during pregnancy. The first test should be as early as possible, ideally during the first trimester. The second test around the third trimester, ideally between 28 and 32 weeks. And then the third test should be at delivery. Now we'll move on to STI treatments. Okay, so no matter where our patients are being tested or screened at clinics, offices, ERs, urgent cares, we need to know how to treat the condition. Now, there are too many updates to go over in the updated guide, 2021 STI treatment guidelines. And of course, the best way is to look up that condition rather than trying to remember something that you saw or heard about in a webinar. But that being said, I am still sharing with you uh, the cheat sheet from the California PTC, um, also the CDPH Dear Colleague letter, and a few excellent webinar hyperlinks that really review the changes and updates in great detail. I encourage you to watch these or listen to them maybe on your commute in and out of work. All right, what I'd like to spend a little bit more time kind of goes beyond that direct patient care. And this is how we're gonna provide a broader sense of care and healthcare to reduce sexually transmitted infections um, on a more grander scale, kind of like that public health scale. And this is by treating sex partners through something called expedited partner therapy or EPT. And by definition, EPT is, as you can read, the practice of specified healthcare provider who diagnoses sexually transmitted chlamydia, gonorrhea, or another sexually transmitted infection and prescribes, dispenses, furnishes, or otherwise provides prescription antibiotic drugs to that patient's sexual partner or partners without examination of the sexual partner. So let's say our patient, Taylor, tests positive for chlamydia. He tells you he's been with two sexual partners in the past 60 days. And one or both of these partners likely have chlamydia and could benefit from antibiotics. And so this is where EPT comes into play. You can provide doxycycline without examining the sexual partners so that they get treated. And research does tell us this is safe and provides equitable health care. And we also know from studies that people up to 14% of people with chlamydia and about 12% of people with gonorrhea become reinfected within 12 months through their untreated partners. And so this is a good way of help reducing sexually transmitted infection acquisition and transmission. So overall EPT reduces that burden of STIs. Um, I have included Senate Bill 306 that expands EPT in the state of California. And there's also an entire webinar that reviews those details, which I've provided a hyperlink as well. Now, if our patient Taylor says, no way doc, I'm telling you who I slept with, we can provide him information and a resource that he can anonymously notify his partners so that they also get treated. And that's through tellyourpartner.org. All right, we've talked about screening, treating. Now we're gonna dive into some preventing of STIs kind of goes a little bit beyond what we're used to as, as uh, condoms that you see pictured here. And we need to be realistic about this. You know, some patients won't wear condoms. They may not use them correctly. And we have to meet patients where they are and have meaningful conversations with those patients. Because it, sometimes if we paternalistically drill that patient to only use condoms as protection, our patient may not return to our clinic and they may not use condoms anyways. And so instead, we have to offer options. And in this case, we're going to specifically review the biochemical prevention tools that we can use to reduce bacterial STIs. All right. Our patient, Taylor, has been treated for chlamydia. His partners have been treated for chlamydia through EPT. And now we can discuss something called DOXY-ASPEP, which stands for doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis. 
Now, we're not going to go into too much detail as the California PTC is going to dedicate an entire webinar to this topic next month. I believe it's April 28th with Dr. Stephanie Cohen. And I've included the, the link at the bottom of this slide uh, so that you can have that to register. But in brief, uh, doxy as PEP is a single dose of 200 milligrams of doxycycline. It's taken within 72 hours after condomless sex. And so that's oral, anal, or insertive vaginal sex to reduce infections of gonorrhea, chlamydia, and syphilis. There are three major studies that were evaluating doxy as PEP, and most were among men who have sex with men and transgendered women. There is no data for transgender men, um, but a study out of Kenya recently evaluated the safety and efficacy of doxy as PEP in cisgendered women, but it was not shown to be effective. And so more data is needed in that realm. In this slide, I wanted you to see kind of the specific percentages of reduced bacterial STIs in men who have sex with men and transgender women in the specific doxy PEP study. It was a randomized study of over 500 participants. They were either on HIV for PrEP or persons living with HIV, and then divided between groups of having doxycycline as post-exposure prophylaxis or no doxy. You can see in both of these groups and the participant groups, the, those that were on doxy as PEP had significant reductions in bacterial STIs with the ranging for syphilis and chlamydia reduced by 74 to 88% and gonorrhea reduced by over 50%. Now remember, doxy as PEP um, for the use of other STIs like mycoplasma, genitalium, or MGen is unknown. And then, of course, we know that antibiotics do not work against viruses like herpes, HPV, HIV, or MPOX. Now we're going to shift gears a little bit to HIV. You can see some data here in California. In 2020, there were 134,000 plus people living with HIV. On the left, You'll see, um, notice the transmission rate categories among males are particularly through male to male sexual contact. On the right uh, in purple, about three quarters is also associated with sexual contact between male and female, but nearly a quarter in light blue on the right represents women who use drugs. The good news is the rates of uh, HIV infections in California are going down. In 2020, there was just under 4,000 people newly diagnosed with HIV. But again, bear in mind, this was also during the start of the COVID pandemic, and the number may be underrepresentative of the true number of new HIV infections. But overall, there's a trend going down, which is great. Now, our first category in the realm of HIV preventative strategies, it will kind of review structural and behavioral interventions. Now, because HIV has the ability to enter through the mucosa of the foreskin of the penis, circumcision is still an option. And even though there have been various studies showing decreased heterosexual acquisition in circumcised males, most of us clinicians are kind of reluctant to offer um, or maybe recommend voluntary circumcision as a, as a preference. Instead, what we should do more often, what we all kind of do already, is counseling and harm reduction, advocating for the use of condoms, safe syringe service programs, and of course, we'll learn later of other opportunities as well. All these methods on the slide help reduce HIV transmission or acquisition, and we should continue to educate our patients on these modalities. Now, being diagnosed with an STI should sound off alarm bells to physicians and be our red flag, as these identify patients that are at high risk of acquiring HIV. There are studies in New York and Australia that showed that men who have sex with men, if they were diagnosed with rectal gonorrhea or rectal chlamydia or diagnosed with syphilis, as low as one in every 15 acquired HIV within the year. So it's pretty significant there. We know that STIs increase viral shedding for greater chances of HIV transmission. We know that STIs increase target cells for greater chances of HIV acquisition. And STIs can simply break down the skin for easy HIV entry. A study in Tanzania showed that treating STIs will reduce HIV transmission and acquisition by nearly 40%. So one of the reasons it's important to screen our patients for STIs and then treat them appropriately to help prevent HIV. Now, not only does treating STIs prevent HIV, but treating persons living with HIV also prevents HIV. This is often referred to as that treatment as prevention or U equals U, which is undetectable. So an undetectable viral load 
is untransmittable and not being able to transmit to someone else. There are three major studies that uh, illuminate this uh, idea of treatment as prevention in the U equals U concept. On the left, the HIV Prevention Trials Network study demonstrated 96% reduction of HIV transmission within serodiscordant heterosexual couples. And then on the right, the Partner and Partner 2 trials showed no documented cases of within couple HIV transmission among men who have sex with men. There were 15 new HIV diagnoses in the partner studies, but none were phylogenetically linked to their partner and therefore they acquired HIV outside of their relationship. What is very fascinating about these studies, the, the partner and partner two studies, that the authors documented over 76,000 condomless sex acts in these trials. And so that truly represents undetectable equals untransmittable and something we should be sharing with our patients who have HIV to be virally suppressed. Now it's time to introduce HIV PrEP, and this is the biochemical way to prevent HIV. HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis is meant for HIV negative individuals at high risk for acquiring HIV. It's a biochemical barrier versus like that physical barrier that provided by condoms. HIV PrEP doesn't and shouldn't be standalone prevention, but part of a comprehensive plan to reduce the risk of acquiring HIV, like treating STIs, offering condoms, et cetera. Now today, there are three options. The first two are oral medications, and blue lettering is a fixed dose combination of m plus tenofovir disoproxyl fumarate, that's the brand name Truvada, and the other oral fixed combination in green is m plus tenofovir alafenamide, and that's brand name Descovy. The third option is a bimonthly injectable, colored here in purple, known as cabotegravir or CAB-LA, and that's the brand name Apritude. Each drug here operates at a different stage in the HIV life cycle, and that's how it prevents HIV from becoming infectious. And in fact, these therapies are so effective at preventing HIV that the United States Preventative Service Tax Force in July of 2019 declared that clinicians offer pre-exposure prophylaxis with effective antiretroviral therapy to persons who are at high risk of HIV acquisition. We're not gonna go into exquisite detail of HIV PrEP. It would be a lecture in and of itself, but we'll touch base on the foundations of HIV PrEP that can be useful in clinical practice. Between the two oral HIV PrEP options, there are subtle differences, slightly dissimilar side effect profiles that may be necessary in clinical practice. And so looking to the right and left under uh, each of these pill il illustrations, you'll see a list of each drug's target population, safety, and side effects. But since the diagram's publication, the TDF-based regimen on the left has become generic and likely costs much less than depicted on this, on this diagram. And in most cases, uh, PrEP is covered 100% by insurance uh, due to its USPSTF's grade A recommendations. Now, both are very well tolerated and safe. Now, when we start patients on HIV PrEP, on average, it takes approximately seven days to be effective in rectal tissue with daily dosing. This is for oral PrEP. And it's about 21 days in cervical vaginal tissue and the same amount of time advised for persons who inject drugs. Now, we have to be sure to counsel our patients about this so they don't just pop one or two pills and think they're protected. Um, unfortunately, we don't know any uh, or we don't have any good data for cisgender men who practice insertive or anal or in sort of vaginal sex. And at this time, we also don't know how long it takes for maximum protection for those patients who would be on injectable HIV PrEP. Now, in the office, our patient Taylor has come back. We offer him daily HIV PrEP, but he tells you he doesn't want to take a pill every single day. And so through that good sexual history taking, you learn that Taylor is more calculated when it comes to having sex. And he plans typically when he's on vacation or maybe at a holiday or, or a particular event. There was a study in France, the Ipergay study, that demonstrated an alternative option for men who have sex with men called on-demand PrEP. And it's basically taking oral PrEP when you need it. Now, it's not approved by the FDA or CDC, but some U.S. health departments and foreign organizations do recommend this off-label use of on-demand PrEP. I prefer to call it by its more prescriptive terminology of 2-1-1 PrEP. 
And then this diagram, you'll see 211 prep. Uh, this is where you take two pills, uh, approximately two to 24 hours before the sexual encounter, uh, one pill 24 hours later, and another pill 24 hours after that, so essentially 48 hours after the first dose. You would continue to take one pill for two days after a sexual encounter. So if you're having sex every single day, you continue to take one pill daily until two days after the last encounter. Now, three months later, our patient comes back, says, I forget my pills, doc, there has to be something else. And this is the case where our patient might benefit uh, with the, the choice of having injectable HIV PrEP CAB LA. The HIV Prevention Trials Network Studies 83 and 84 evaluated injectable PrEP among MSM, transgender women, and cisgendered females. And in these trials, it did show that injectable PrEP was superior to oral PrEP in those participants. But there are some things to consider with patients on injectable PrEP. That, that patient has to be consistent for follow-up office appointments for those injections. It might be difficult for someone who does travel a lot for work. Maybe they have regular no-shows at the office or they miss appointments for other reasons. The other thing to consider is CAB LA lingers in the body for quite a while beyond 12 months. And so if a patient stops taking uh, the injections, you ha might have to convert them over, over to oral PrEP to cover if they're still at risk for acquiring HIV. Another concern about CAB LA is that the studies did show some breakthrough infections, even when participants were having timely or on-time injections. And it was complicated too by a delay in diagnosis of HIV when using a traditional HIV antigen antibody screening test. And so therefore, some, some experts do recommend screening patients on injectable PrEP with an HIV RNA test but that can be more costly and a potential barrier for some patients that do want coverage. Now, how to use CAB LA, um, I illustrated in this little light green box at the bottom for your reference. Now, the tables on the left are not meant to, to be read. They were purposely made to be too small, and so you can't read them clearly, but just represent the differences between prescribing oral HIV PrEP and injectable HIV PrEP. Each table does represent different labs that are recommended or needed for HIV PrEP, orals on the top, injectables on the bottom. And on the right side of the slide um, is a simplified follow-up recommendations for persons on HIV PrEP. First and foremost, making sure one is adherent to the medication or injection appointments, make sure they're negative for HIV. But keeping in mind there are differences for the screening tests on the left of those tables, differences in STI screening intervals and also differences in follow-up labs, depending on which HIV PrEP regimen you're prescribing. And of course, for all of our HIV PrEP patients, we do recommend getting prophylactic vaccines, which my colleague Katerina will share with you in a moment. And finally, uh, HIV's kind of day after pills, uh, we call post-exposure prophylaxis or PEP. Uh, okay, so we have our, our patient Taylor again. He, call, he calls the office Monday morning and he says, doc, I've messed up, didn't use a condom, wasn't taking his oral prep as prescribed, and now he's worried about being exposed to HIV after having sex Saturday night. In this case, you could offer him HIV PEP. PEP is a three-drug regimen. needs to be started within 72 hours, so Saturday night to Monday is within 72 hours, and it needs to be taken for 28 days. You would order some baseline labs, and you'd recommend follow-up labs in the coming weeks and months. But you know, as a busy clinician, it's a Monday. You didn't do your 53 uh, charts over the weekend. You have 17 acute appointments coming in. You have 103 chronic care appointments already quadruple booked in your schedule. And you feel like, gosh, I can't, I, I, I don't know what to do. I can't remember what to do. But there's good news. Um, at the bottom in this yellow uh, kind of highlighted box, there is an HIV hotline or a PEP line that is available to clinicians for consultations. And so you can call them, walk through the scenario that you're in, and then get guidelines on what to do thereafter. All right, and then here for reference purposes only are some common ICD-10 codes that are related to PrEP and PEP. And the next slide is some HIV PrEP resources. And then one last thing as a public service announcement, just to let everyone know in the state of California, anyone is able to get free HIV testing kits. Uh, and this is offered by the Building Healthy Online Communities. 
Uh, the organization Don't Think No also offers HIV tests. However, that's limited in certain counties of California. Now, this may not be directly for your patients' needs, but this is something that maybe our patients can offer to their friends uh, to get tested and get HIV tested as well. And with that, we're going to pass it off to Katerina. Thanks so much, Curtis, and thanks for advancing the slides, Curtis. So um, in this section, we'll shift gears and focus on vaccines. And I'll start with talking a little bit about adult immunization recommendations and then focus on a few selected vaccines that may be relevant to your population. Um, since we don't have a ton of time, this will be a very high level overview of the various vaccines that are listed here. And next slide. So just as an overview, adult vaccination rates overall are unfortunately very low, and there are multiple reasons for this. There are various barriers to access related to insurance, um, and also any adults actually don't know that they need vaccines. On the slide are depicted a few selected vaccines, and what you can see is that the adult vaccination rate in orange is lower than the healthy people target, which is in blue, uh, for a variety of vaccines, including hepatitis B and HPV and flu. Next slide. The CDC and other groups have created the standards for adult immunization practice, and this includes assessing the immunization status of all your patients at every clinical encounter to recommend those vaccines that patients need, and most optimally to administer those vaccines at that clinical encounter if you're able to, or to refer your patients to a vaccination provider and to document vaccines received by your patients. I'll highlight here that the recommendation from a clinician is one of the major reasons why someone decides to get vaccinated. So you play a critical role in getting your patients protected. Next slide. So I just wanted to quickly highlight that CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices creates the immunization schedule, uh, both for children and adults. And for the adult schedule, there's two components. Uh, there's table one, which is summarizing the recommendations by age. If you go to the next slide. Uh, some of the, just to summarize some of the major categories of age-based recommendations for everyone, flu, COVID-19, Tdap, and Hep B vaccine are recommended. For people 26 and older, HPV is recommended. And for people 50 to 65 years, Zoster and pneumococcal vaccines are recommended. And a more detailed um, set of information is in that um, CDC guidance. Next slide. In addition, CDC also has a very complicated table of guidance, which is related to medical conditions or other indications for vaccination. This is a really helpful resource, but again, very, very complicated. Next slide. So just to summarize some of those indications, these include chronic diseases, like things that you'll see commonly in clinic, diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, people who are immunocompromised, so those patients with HIV that Curtis was talking about, uh, non-HIV immunosuppression who don't have spleens, uh, people with certain occupational risks, and then people who have certain behavioral social conditions, including uh, men who are sexually active with men, um, and people who are using substances, and people who are experiencing homelessness, and also a separate category for people who are pregnant. So lots of different indications for vaccination, um, and we'll talk at the end about some of the resources available to help you assess for those indications and the recommend recommended vaccines. Next slide. So next, diving in, uh, just talking by condition and also by vaccine. So first, talking about hepatitis A. Um, this is an acute liver infection caused by the hepatitis A virus and is spread by person-to-person -person contact um, and also by contaminated food or water. You may have seen them in the news. There are various risk factors for infection, and those include uh, men who have sex with men, people who use injection or non-injection drugs, people who are experiencing homelessness, and there are uh, several other risk factors, which we'll talk about later. Certain people are at increased risk of severe disease, and those include people with HIV and people with other types of liver disease. And so really um, important to get people protected. Next slide. So who's getting hep hepatitis A in the US currently? Unfortunately, there have been large person-to-person -person outbreaks across the U.S. since 2016, which have primarily affected people who are using drugs and people who are experiencing homelessness. In California, there was a big outbreak of hepatitis A in 2016 to 2018, which is fortunately over. Uh, but again, the risk remains. 
the graph here on the right just shows you the incidence of hepatitis A in the US. And you can see that starting in 2017, there's been a big increase. And um, fortunately in California, as I mentioned, the outbreak is over, um, but this continues to be a great concern. Uh, next slide. So in terms of who's recommended for a hepatitis A vaccine, um, that's recommended for adults who want to be vaccinated and adults who are at increased risk for hepatitis A infection. And those include people who have liver disease, living with HIV, um, as they're at increased risk of getting really sick from hepatitis A, um, people who use injection and non-injection drug use, uh, people who are experiencing homelessness, men who are sexually active with men, um, and people who have other exposure risks, whether from work or travel or um, household contact. Next slide. There are two um, hepatitis A only vaccines. They're very similar. One's called Havrix, one's called Bacta. They're both two doses and they're either given six to 12 or six to 18 months apart. And then there's also a three dose option, which is a combination vaccine of twin, called Twinrix, which is a hepatitis A and hepatitis B combination. Next slide. Uh, next, moving on to another hepatitis virus, uh, hepatitis B. This is caused by hepatitis B virus, which can lead to chronic infection, unlike hepatitis A, and unfortunately, long-term serious outcomes, including liver cancer and cirrhosis, and is spread by percutaneous or mucosal contact with infectious blood or body fluids. And certain people are at increased risk, including men who are sexually active with men, people who inject drugs, and sexual partners of people who have hepatitis B infection. Next slide. Hepatitis B um, disproportionately affects people who were born outside of the US. So globally, there are nearly 300 million people who are living with hepatitis B. And the graph on the right shows you, the map on the right shows you the countries in the world where there's high hepatitis B prevalence. So the darker the countries, the more hepatitis B there is. And so in uh, from CDC, the burden of hepatitis B is a tale of two epidemiologies, people who are who were born outside of the US and then people who were born in the US, but who have certain risk factors, um, including substance use. Uh, so the number of cases of acute hepatitis B has increased um, among adults age 40 and over. And as a result, CDC has updated their vaccination and also screening recommendations, which I'll cover a little bit later. Next slide. So CDC has recently in the last several weeks updated their hepatitis B screening guidance. So for a little context, you may remember that hepatitis B vaccine, uh, sorry, hepatitis B screening recommendations were risk-based. Uh, the new recommendation is now much simpler. So it's now, the recommendation is now for a universal adult screening with a triple panel, which includes the hepatitis B surface antigen, antibody to hepatitis B surface antigen, and total antibody to hepatitis B core antigen. Um, previously, the recommendations also only included one of the tests, the surface antigen, but now uh, the new recommendation is simplified and has all of the tests, all, all three tests. Um, in addition, they've updated the recommendations for pregnant people. So now th these three test panels recommended uh, for screening, at least for the first pregnancy for all pregnant people. Next slide. As a quick note, Curtis talked about the USPSTF for the United States Preventive Services Task Force, which also makes screening recommendations. Uh, they continue to recommend risk-based hepatitis B screening. They um, may change their guidance in the future, but we'll keep you, we will keep you updated if that happens. But that's currently, their recommendations currently still follow the original risk-based recommendation. And California law, AB 789, does require hepatitis B and C screening uh, based on the USPSCF guidance in primary care settings. And so at this point, it's still a risk-based um, screening recommendation as well. In terms of screening and vaccination, you can do both at the same visit. Um, but if someone does, so on the graphic on the right, if you follow the recommendations and also what's mandated by law to screen someone. If they screen negative, um, you can recommend the hepatitis B vaccine, which is which I'll talk about in a, in a moment, is universally recommended for all adults. Um, and then for if they screen positive for either hepatitis B or C to refer them to follow-up care. So in the case of someone who screens positive for hepatitis B and you give them a vaccine um, to stop giving them more vaccine and to refer them for follow-up. Next slide. 
So just a quick overview of hepatitis B vaccine recommendations, which, which have also been simplified in, in the last year. Hepatitis B vaccine is now recommended for all adults 19 through 59. For people 16 and over, it's anyone who wants it and also people who are at increased risk. So that includes people who have liver disease, HIV, use injection drugs, have risk for exposure to blood, um, sexual exposure risk, or who are incarcerated. Next slide. Quickly around hepatitis B vaccine options, you do have more. There's a two dose vaccine series called Heplosav B, which is great because um, it's only two doses and really increases the likelihood that someone might complete the series. The other options are three dose series and there's four different options, including Indurex B, Recombivax HB, Prehevrio and Twinrix, which was that combination vaccine that I just mentioned. We also have a really helpful job aid that just illustrates uh, for you which vaccines are available and how many doses they are. So that's just a resource for you. And then I just also wanted to highlight that our team has produced a very short job aid um, for clinicians to just remind you of the new vaccination and screening guidance for hepatitis B virus. So on um, one page includes just a quick reference on who should be vaccinated, who should be screened, and then a table of the hepatitis B serology interpretation, which we understand is very confusing, and it tells you um, what the clinical state is and then what to do. On the second page, there's some information around people who should be screened um, based on the risk-based screening, and then some information that you can share with patients, and also a link um, to our page of references from CDC and other groups. So we hope that will be a helpful resource um, for your team. Next slide. Uh, next, moving on to a different condition, uh, we'll talk about human papillomavirus, which is very common, affects up to 80% of people in their lifetime, and unfortunately causes many thousands of cases of cancer in the U.S., and is spread by intimate skin-to-skin -skin or sexual contact. On the right-hand side, the graphic just shows you that there's no screening for most cancers caused by HPV. You're most likely uh, familiar with cervical cancer and cervical cancer screening at the top, but oral pharyngeal cancer, anal and vulvar and vaginal and penile cancer can also be caused by HPV. Next slide. And so in terms of the vaccination recommendations, it is recommended for adolescents 11 to 12, and you can start as early as nine and recommended through age 26. For people who are older, 27 to 45, CDC recommends shared clinical decision-making uh, for this population. Next slide. There is one vaccine available, which is the nine valent HPV vaccine and listed here are the different HPV types that it covers. And type 16 and 18 cause 66% of cervical cancers in the US. The number of doses depends on when you started your series. So for most of your adult patients, that would be a three dose series. Next slide. Um, and then next, moving on to meningococcal disease and meningococcal vaccines. This is an acute severe illness caused by a bacteria called Neisseria meningitidis, which is actually very related to Neisseria gonorrhea. Illness can be very severe and include meningitis, bloodstream infection with the bacteria called meningococcemia or severe pneumonia. And unfortunately it has a very high death rate, including, and also severe morbidity, including limb loss. Uh, most diseases caused by serogroups A, B, C, W, X, and Y, most of, which, most of which are covered by our available vaccines. And serogroup B has caused U.S. college outbreaks in recent years, and serogroup C has caused outbreaks among men who have sex with men over the last many years. Next slide. In terms of the vaccines that are available, there are two types of meningococcal vaccines available. And part of the reason is that it took longer to develop the serogroup B or men B vaccines. And so they came out later. And so they're separate at the moment. Um, so the quadrivalent meningococcal vaccine and men ACWY, tell, listing out the different serogroups that it covers, recommended for adolescents 11 to 18 years and also for people two months and older who have risk factors. And CDPH has also issued a recommendation for men who have sex with men and transgender persons who have sex with men um, based on increased risk uh, related to a large outbreak happening in Florida of, of invasive meningococcal disease. 
In terms of uh, the meningococcal serogroup B vaccine, this is a narrower group of people for whom it's recommended. It's recommended for certain people 10 and older who have certain risks, which include lacking a spleen, having a certain condition called complement deficiency or part of an outbreak of uh, occupational risks if they're a microbiologist. Um, and then also under shared decision, clinical decision-making for people 16 to 23 years. And that recommendation is based on what we've seen with college students. Next slide. In terms of the vaccine options, so for each of the two types of vaccines, there are two um, options. So for the quadrivalent meningococcal vaccine, um, there is Menquathi and Menbeo. They're both two doses, two months apart. And then for the Men B vaccine, there's also two, uh, two options, uh, also two doses, and these are one month apart. Uh, one is called Bexero or Men B4C, the other is Tremenba. And then the FHBP, and I'll talk a little bit more about the first one um, on the next on the coming slides. But I just wanted to put here another job that our team has produced just to summarize the different options available for the meningococcal vaccines. Next slide. So just a quick note on meningococcal vaccines and prevention of gonorrhea. And so Neisseria meningitidis and Neisseria gonorrhea are very closely related, although they cause very different illnesses. And previous observational studies in other countries found that a similar meningococcal serogroup B vaccine might offer some modest protection against gonorrhea. Uh, risk reduction estimates were around 30 to 50 percent. And these in these countries, the serogroup meningitis, serogroup B meningitis vaccine was given to prevent meningitis, but uh, then people decided to look at you know, where there was there protection against gonorrhea. And so this has uh, prompted some clinical trials. And recently, a few months ago, um, a study from France did sh share results um, looking at the benefits of two doses of the men before c vaccine on reduction of gonorrhea risk. And so just as a quick science note, the outer membrane vesicle is something that the, the nicereal uh, bacteria just release. And this men b 4 c vaccine, one of the four, the 4C means four components. And one of the components is an outer membrane vesicle component. And so it's, it's related to this vaccine that I talked about in the first bullet, um, where they saw on the population level some benefit against gonorrhea. So this is this kind of the theoretical basis for why this trial was done. So this trial was involved five uh, more than 500 men who were sexually active with men, and they were on HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis. They were all very sexually active um, and had at least one bacterial STI in the last year. They were followed for a median of nine months, and this particular study found a 51% reduction in the risk of first gonococcal infection, um, and a third reduction in the risk of cumulative adjusted incidence rate ratio for gonococcal infection. So certainly very promising information. It is the only clinical trial of its kind um, to be relate, uh, released. So more is to come, um, more studies are underway. There is no current guidance from CDC recommending the use of men b for c vaccine for preventing gonorrhea. If you do have a patient who is eligible for men b vaccine due to the other existing criteria, it's very reasonable to share this information with them, um, but more is likely to come um, in the coming months, two years. Next slide. Uh, next, moving on to a different condition, um, MPOX, which you're likely very familiar with over the last several months. Um, illness with a characteristic rash, which has been described as well circumscribed or umbilicated and caused by infection with the MPOX virus and is spread by close skin-to-skin -skin contact. And on the slide, I've just shown you some pictures from CDC um, illustrating the different stages of the MPOX rash, which goes through every single, nearly every single descriptor of rash from macule to papule, vesicle, pustule, and scab. Next slide. As you are likely aware, there was a large and ongoing outbreak uh, multinationally starting in 2022. On the right hand side, just showing you the US. Um, MPOX cases really peaked last summer and have gone down substantially, although the outbreak is not over. Gay, bisexual, and other men who are sexually active with men do make up most of the cases, and, and cases are unfortunately disproportionately higher among Black and Hispanic or Latino MSM. Next slide. In terms of vaccine recommendations, 
The MPOX vaccine is recommended for post-exposure prophylaxis for people with known or presumed exposure within 14 days of exposure, and for pre-exposure prophylaxis for people who are at increased risk or people who are requesting vaccine. Next slide. In terms of vaccine options, really the only vaccine that's used is Genios, which is two doses, 28 days apart, and is routinely administered subcutaneously, although it can be given intradermally. The other vaccine option, which is theoretically available but has not been used in this outbreak, is ACAM2000, um, which is a live replicating vaccine that is similar to the one that was used to eradicate smallpox. And given the risks of a live replicating vaccine, it's not, um, it's contraindicated in patients living with HIV. In terms of access to this vaccine, you're likely aware of this, but um, it's coming directly from the federal government and so, and, and it's not commercially available. So if you are interested in becoming a vaccinator or accessing vaccine, uh, please contact your local health department. Next slide. So now just to kind of consolidate what we just, I just shared with you, a lot of vaccine information. I um, wanted to go back to Taylor. He's 27, he's sexually active with men. Which of these vaccines that we talked about today would you recommend? And if we can pull up the poll, that would be great. I'll just give you some time to think about it and uh, we'll go from there. All right, I think we can wrap up the poll. All right, great. So lots of selections on all of the vaccines. So we can go on to the next slide. So all of the vaccines, all of the vaccines except for men B are recommended. So hepatitis A, we talked about a recommendation from, AC, from CDC for men who are sexually active with men. For hepatitis B, there's a now a universal adult recommendation. So um, it's possible that Taylor may have been vaccinated as a child, but if he is not vaccinated, he's susceptible then to vaccinate him. Um, HPV is recommended for people 27 to 45 under shared decision-making. So again, he may have been vaccinated earlier in life, um, but if he hasn't been, uh, still recommended as men, ACWY, also recommended for men who are sexually active with men. A men B is not recommended for his age group, and he doesn't, if he's healthy, he doesn't have any of the conditions that would qualify him for vaccination at this time. And then MPOX is recommended for people who are at increased risk. Next slide. So I just also wanted to highlight here the CDC's adult immunization schedule indications table, which just gives you a sense of the different vaccines that are recommended um, by um, condition so, or other indications. So on the right-hand column, um, men who have sex with men, just looking down at the various vaccines that are, available, that are recommended, um, including a number of common ones that we didn't talk about like COVID and flu, um, and then also the ones that we were just talking about a moment ago. Next slide. So I'll just wrap it up with a few resources. There are various resources available to help you assess whether someone needs to be vaccinated and what vaccines that they might need. So we talked about CDC's ACIP adult immunization schedule, which really shares a lot of very detailed information. And that is paired with these apps from CDC and also the American Academy of Family Physicians, um, which help, uh, help you at the point of care if you want to know which vaccines patients are recommended for. The other resource that I wanted to highlight is that the California Immunization Registry has functionalities that allow you to both pull at a clinic level which vaccines patients are due for and also to print out um, which vaccines patients might be due for um, and on one page. So various reports that are useful for you. Next slide. There's also, you may have heard about the digital vaccine record, but I wanted to just highlight this as a resource for your patients. So previously this, this was initially developed for COVID-19 vaccine, but actually is now available to, um, for people to get all of their routine vaccines. 
they can just go to the website, put in their information, and what, what's populating the vaccine record is what's in the immunization registry. So just another tool to empower your patients to know what vaccines um, they've received. And also it does give you um, some age-based recommendations for which vaccines you might be due for. Next slide. Uh, just, I wanted to just highlight a few resources, including the CDC's pages on the schedule and vaccine recommendations by um, disease and also the MPOX recommendations. Uh, next slide. And then just to conclude, uh, we talked about many vaccines that can prevent hepatitis A, B, HPV, MPOX, and meningococcal disease. And we also talked about CDC's new universal hepatitis B screening in adults. Just wanted to encourage you to continue to strongly recommend vaccines that your patients need as clinicians are the most trusted source of health information for adults. And CDC and CDPH also have a large number of resources available. So I'll hand it back to Curtis to close us out. Thank you. All right, thanks Katarina, that's great. Uh, this is just to kind of review our learning objectives. So number one was reviewing screening and treatment resources for STIs and HIV. So we gave you some tools, apps, some links, and guides to recommend the best screening, treating, and prevention of STI and HIV practices. Number two, integrating biochemical prevention tools for STIs and HIV. Kind of shared with you the power of U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable, treatment as prevention, along with HIV PrEP and PEP and the hot topic of doxy as PEP, which again is more to come April 28th. And then Katerina did summarize some recommendations for vaccines where she discussed resources to help immunize your patients. And going forward, it's now time for questions. So thank you. I think at this time awesome. I stop sharing. <laughs> that would be great. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore and Dr. Liu for speaking with us today and for sharing all of this great information, all these great resources. I think this is super helpful. We have a number of questions in the chat. I've been answering them as we go, but they're still popping up. Um, so I'm just going to start feeding them to you. I will start with a question for Dr. Moore. This was one of our first questions. Um, this is getting back to one of your early slides about sexual history taking, and you presented the P's, you know, as, as noted by the CDC. This requester says, what are your thoughts on the six P's as put forth by the National Coalition for Sexual Health? These P's include some more aspirational components, things like sexual pleasure, sexual problems, and pride. So just curious what you think about those aspects of sexual history taking and whether they should be routinely incorporated or more sort of like the goal as you get experienced, I'll let you speak to that. Yes, and I think is the phrase that people are saying these days <laughs> uh, for a number of things. Um, I know time is limited with um, patients. Uh, I think making those connections on a more personal level will just give you more information and how to make the best recommendations. So I think the more we can incorporate, the better you're going to be, especially on those things is, and and one of the things you mentioned, Kelly, uh, was pleasure. Uh, condoms become a big thing as far as pleasure, not using condoms. So that should make us think, well, doxy is PEP, HIV PrEP, those types of things, a biochemical way for protection. So I, I agree with all those that they can be incorporated. Totally, I agree. And sort of that's what I had said in the chat as well, that I feel like these are great aspects and they're probably aspirational. It's awesome if you can get there. If you're just starting out, it might be easier to start with some of the more basic questions. And then as you get more comfortable, add in the extras. And it sounds like Dr. Moore agrees with that approach. Awesome, thank you. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Liu for another question. We had a number of questions related to hepatitis B vaccination, and this is one of them. This question is about healthcare workers or patients. So let's say somebody received hepatitis B vaccine in the past, you have documentation, they got their vaccine, but they don't show a surface antibody. What do you recommend? Uh, that is a great question. CDC does have some detailed guidance on that. So let me go and find it and I can put that in the chat or I can respond to the question as well. Uh, but I'd say that for some of these more detailed questions around hepatitis B vaccine, some of them are addressed by more detailed guidance from CDC. Uh, so to make sure that I give you the right answer, I'll go find it. 
Awesome, because we answered this question live, it will show up in the answered questions in the Q&A, but you can go ahead and find it if you do want to add more information there. Okay, let me go to another question. This one will also be for Dr. Moore. So going back to Dr. Moore while Dr. Liu looks up information about hepatitis B. Um, this question's about expedited partner therapy or EPT. For EPT, would you try to schedule an appointment with the partner if you could, just to make sure they don't have things like allergies or effects? Um, and any tips to, about what to do if you do recommend that the, the partner come in, but they refuse to have an appointment? So basically, like, do you recommend that the partner comes in? And what if the partner says, no, I'm not coming in? What do you do? Yeah, I think a recommendation for a face to face visit, either video or maybe telephone or in person, I think is great. But sometimes these partners don't have insurance. You're not the primary care doctor. You're you're not available to that patient to be seen. And that's, I think, some the kind of purpose of EPT to provide it beyond the extension of where, where you reach. Um, it is good, I think, to have more information, but research does show it is safe and and that we can do this uh, with very little concern that allergies might be, more, more particularly that's what people bring up is allergies probably are not gonna be that much of an issue. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And actually, if you go to the California Department of Public Health website, the STD control branch, it's std.ca.gov, there are resources related to EPT, including some information about protections for providers who prescribe EPT. And we do have upcoming resources that are going to address a little bit more. How do you prescribe EPT? What messaging should you share with partners? So I agree with the approach that Dr. Moore is suggesting. If you can get a partner to come in, that's great, that's optimal. But if you can't, then EPT is your next best way to try to reach those partners and get them at least treated for the STI that we know they were exposed to. Optimally, you would be providing information about potential allergies and about contraindications, for example, like don't take doxycycline if you're pregnant. Those kinds of things ideally would come with the prescription or with the medication um, if you're just sending it to go to a partner that you're not going to meet in person. Great. Okay. So I'm going to go back to Dr. Liu because she has returned. Um, this question is about the meningococcal vaccination recommendations. And I think this is related to the Florida outbreak, which was in MSM. And the question states, given that this recommendation for meningococcal vaccine for MSM and transgender people stemming from the outbreak in Florida, how long do you think this should be a, an approach? And, and I, I, I don't practice in Florida. I'm not sure what's what the Florida recommendations are. I know you covered in your talk that this isn't a current CDPH recommendation, but can you speak to this at all? And you know, if you can't, that's okay. But just want to see if we can address this question a little yeah. bit in more detail Thanks. than I do. Thanks for the question. Um, so CDPH actually last June did issue recommendation for um, quadrivalent meningococcal vaccine in California. Um, so it does go a little bit beyond what CDC's recommendation is, which is um, that if someone lives in Florida or is planning to travel to Florida and um, is an MSM, and then they should get vaccinated. So CD, I can put the link um, in the chat as well for the uh, California Health Advisory. That's still, um, Health advisory still is relevant. We haven't changed that. So um, if there were any updates, um, certainly we would let you all know. Uh, but right now that is still current. And CDP, uh, sorry, CDC's page um, still continues to recommend the Florida travel and Florida-based um, MSM recommendation. Got it. Thank you for helping me understand the Florida piece there. I really appreciate that, as well as for sharing the CDPH recommendations. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna go back now to Dr. Moore. And this is an interesting question to which I'm curious what you think. This person asks, I'm curious about any research pertinent to HIV prevention for cisgender women using intravaginal gels. It says apparently non-oxal-9 increases risk, but a different gel, Fexi, I'm not familiar with it, does not. Anything else out there? And again, 
I'm, I'm personally not super familiar with this, this area for HIV prevention using gels. And I'm curious if you're aware of anything given your fellowship training. Yeah, um, the N9 spermicide, there was some concerns that might increase the risk of HIV acquisition by the female. And part of that um, was only evaluated in African countries and the relatability to US population might be different. It was um, sex workers in Africa. But as far as gels for prevention, um, tenofovir gel was being used and evaluated. Uh, I don't think it, it worked well and it has not been recommended. Uh, that's the only thing I was uh, familiar with. Um, I'm not sure that other compounds or drug that you mentioned, Kelly, what that is. I, I don't recall reading that. Yeah, I'm also not familiar with it. So thank you for, for the question. And if you want to put more details into the Q&A about your question, we'd be happy to try to address them. Otherwise, I agree with what Dr. Moore was saying and appreciate the additional insights that he was able to share. I'm going to go back to Dr. Liu, and I think this is sort of a hard question, um, but the requester is asking again about hepatitis B vaccination. This was a hot topic, and specifically about insurance coverage for hepatitis B vaccination, and even more specifically about FPACT. It looks to me and to this requester like FPACT um, has removed that benefit, and this requester is just wondering if you know whether that benefit has come back at this point. On my prelim search on the internet, uh, I think the answer is no, but I just want to confirm if you know anything more about that. I don't know anything more about uh, Family Pact and Hep B vaccine. Um, just, uh, just maybe a comment about Hep B vaccine. It is recommended by ACAP. Um, so if it's recommended by ACP, it should be covered by insurance. However, we recognize that unfortunately people may be uninsured or underinsured. And so for those individuals, we. California does have a vaccines for adults program. And so for clinics that are enrolled, they can obtain uh, vaccines to vaccinate their uninsured population. And so we do offer both the two dose and three dose hepatitis B vaccine. Um, so if you're hearing about BFA right now, enrollment is closed, um, but um, please, I can put the information on the in the chat if you wanted to learn a little bit more about the program. Unfortunately, the funds for the program are, are limited. Um, but that's one resource that we have in California. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. I am going to go back to Dr. Moore. This is a question about doxycycline post-exposure prophylaxis. And as you mentioned, CAPTC does have a separate webinar coming up next month all about doxypep. So we'll cover this topic in a lot more detail next month, April 28th. Um, but the question for you right now, Dr. Moore, is, is there a concern that measures like presumptively treating sex partners and doxypep will drive up antibiotic resistance? We don't know. Uh, what little we do know from the studies is when they were following for antibiotic resistance, uh, not just in gonorrhea, but also commensal Neisseria species, uh, Staph aureus species. Um, it was showing that there weren't really changes in antibiotic resistance. Um, one way to think about it is um, if you're preventing an infection, then you're not using an entire prescription of, say, doxycycline to prevent or to treat chlamydia or the use of ceftriaxone. You wouldn't, the, some of the studies show that there's a 50% less use of ceftriaxone for treatment because of the one-time dosing of doxycycline. Uh, and so it's kind of a balance um, on whether or not we would see it. There are studies that have evaluated doxycycline that's taken as a, a preventative for acne and malaria. Um, we've seen people have been on that for months at a time. Um, and that seen um, over the years have probably not been contributing too much uh, than just one-time dosing as a post-exposure mechanism. So I'm sure more information will come out um, as the years go by, but um, I'm hoping, no, um, doxycycline has been around since the 60s and seems to be doing pretty well. So let's, fingers crossed, things are going well and continue to go well. Thank you. 
I agree with that. I think the answer to the question, are there concerns about this? The answer is yes. Like people are definitely worried about antibiotic resistance with doxycycline, but we don't know. I agree with what Dr. Moore is saying. We have a lot of studies that are ongoing. The short-term prelim studies are looking pretty promising against um, significant increases in resistance, at least in Staph aureus and perhaps commensal Neisseria, as Dr. Moore mentioned, but a lot more to come and we probably are going to need a lot more time to answer this question more thoroughly. Okay, everyone, we are right at time. It is time to end this webinar. I, again, I really, really, on behalf of the CAPTC and the California Department of Public Health, I want to thank Dr. Moore and thank Dr. Ligo for being here, for sharing your expertise. We will share a copy of these um, slides and the recording in two weeks from today. So look for that in your inbox. And we wanna thank you all for your participation and your engagement today. The end, thank you.